I thought I'd put a video together with some top tips for the organic paper H43202. It's not an exhaustive list, there are more tips than this, but these are just things that I see in my sort of day to day teaching job things to remember or things to not do. So, in mechanisms, curly arrows show the movement of an electron pair, so you must start them from bonds, not atoms or from the delocalized electron cloud of benzene. So you can see there that that is completely wrong. It's going from the plus into the delocalized electron cloud. And curly arrows must start from either a minus sign or a lone pair of a nucleophile. So example of that, the H minus ion in the reduction of carbonyls mechanism. Benzene mechanisms, just remember that that partial electron cloud in the intermediate, you need to cover five carbons with that and don't forget the plus sign in the middle. So five carbons covered, plus sign in the middle. And there's that curly arrow, the pair of electrons from the bond. Spellings, it's electrophilic, not electrophilic, and nucleophilic not nucleophilic. EZ isomers, my tip is to base your diagram on an ethane molecule. So if you can sort of construct a diagram like that, so carbon-carbon double bond, and then just put your four groups on, and then decide which are the priority groups, and therefore which is the E and which is the Z. Addition polymers, again, using ethane to sort of make life easy for ourselves. So we've got this sort of nasty looking um, molecule here. If we just focus on this part for the monomer, so we base it on an ethane molecule. So you'd have hydrogen there, this group there, hydrogen there, and then this carboxylic acid group there. Condensation polymers, so we've got the same molecule, but this time we might be asked to draw the condensation polymer from this monomer. So we'll take an H and an OH off and join together. So in this case, we take one of these H's off and this OH off and join together. So we'd make an amide group in that case. If that was a hydroxyl group there, so it was like phenol, you could take the OH off there and then just the H off there, or you could take this OH off and the H off the phenol group. Repeat units, don't forget about your end bonds, make sure they poke through the bracket. State symbols, if it asks for them, write them. You have to give your answer to so many significant figures. Double check, triple check. If you have to give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures, you need to use the least accurate measurement given for all the data in the question. Units. Remember, moles are calculated using grams. Just be careful if masses, which they often are, are given in kilos milligrams for sort of pharmaceuticals and tons for those industrial processes. Percentage yield now, so imagine a process has a 72% yield, calculate the moles of product made. So the way I would do it is calculate the moles as normal as if it was 100% yield and then you need to multiply by the percentage yield, so 0.72 in this case, to factor in the yield to get those moles made. Obviously you're going to make fewer moles than the 100% yield suggests. If it's the other way around, a process has the same yield, calculate the moles of reactant required, you're going to need to do the opposite because you're going to need more. So again, calculate the moles as if 100% yield, but this time divide by the 72 and multiply by the 100 and that would scale it up and factor in the yield. 
If it says include equations in your answer, include them. Hydrolysis is always reflux with aqueous acid or aqueous alkali. You must make reference to water. If you've got acid hydrolysis, so this could be of a polyester or a polyamide or something like that, or an ester itself, the first thing you would do is split the molecule up, so either the ester bond, the amide bond, the peptide bond, and detach the H and the OH from the water. And then for acid hydrolysis, you need to look at the molecule, where could you attach H pluses from those acidic conditions? So for example, it could be the nitrogen of an amino group, and then it would become N plus with that extra H on, of course. For alkaline hydrolysis, you do the same thing first, split and detach the H and the OH from the water. And then you need to look for where H plus could be lost this time. So it could be the H from a carboxyl group. So a COOH would turn into COO minus. If you haven't to draw the structure of a carboxylate or write the formula of a carboxylate salt, then it's COO minus Na plus or just COO Na. It's not COO dash Na. So that dash there you might think looks like a minus sign, but it looks like a covalent bond to the examiner. Mass spec. Don't forget the positive charge on the formulae of all the species giving those peaks. And the peak furthest to the right is the molecular ion peak, so that tells you the MR. If you've got a tiny little M plus 1 peak, that's still the MR of the molecule, but it's being caused by the molecule containing an isotope with an MR higher by 1. So carbon 13 is an example there. Infrared spectroscopy, don't forget to annotate your spectra. So in this one here, I've said this is the OH of a carboxylic acid group, and this is the C double bond O, and therefore it's definitely a carboxylic acid. NMR spectroscopy now, again, annotate your spectra. So we'll focus on this signal here at 3.7. So the signal at delta 3.7 ppm, due to hydrogens in this environment, we're getting that from the data sheet, it's a quartet, so we're using that appropriate terminology. Therefore, the H's causing the signal are adjacent to a CH3 group. So there's that N plus 1 rule. The peak area of 2 means there are 2 H's in the environment. And you move on and say something similar about this peak. And just remember that the peak at delta zero is the TMS peak, the reference peak.